Yep. All right. So, Drupal and offline world. We all know Drupal, right? But how is the offline world shaped as at the moment? Um, so basically, we have apps, uh, we have websites, we have Google's AMP, we have Facebook uh, instant articles, we have um, Android instant apps, we have AppCache, and we have um, PWA, which stands for Progressive Web Apps. Basically, it's going from good, no, from worst to best. Uh, <laughs> In a Drupal world, that is. So, first off, apps. Um, no apps. We all know apps, right? So the capabilities of apps is online, uh, but also offline. If you open up an app and you don't have any Wi-Fi, you don't get a wide screen of that. You don't get like weird stuff. You just get, um, you just get every functionality that is supposed to work offline. Um, so I'm going to make the comparison with Drupal websites all the time. That's why. So offline capability is quite big, and that's why people love apps so much. If they are in a train, if they're anywhere, you can always open it up. The other two very cool thing about apps are push notifications and background sync. So these are kind of the logos I'm going to use throughout the whole comparison between all the offline instant Wi-Fi capabilities. So we also have background sync. Um, Push notification, basically, quick recap. Push notification is the fact that you have um, notifications when your phone is not turned on or when your phone is not unlocked and you just have stuff, just like Skype has this too, and then you have messages, you have emails coming in. Background sync is a bit more complicated, but basically it's the fact that if you have internet if you, or if you don't, app users don't really care about it. If you send a message through WhatsApp, even read it. Yeah. So if you send a message through WhatsApp, um, it doesn't really matter if you have internet or not. People don't go like, oh, is it sent yet? Is it sent yet? No. They just send it off, and the next time the app connects to the internet, it gets sent. Like when you send a message with WhatsApp and you don't have any internet, you just have a little clock there. They don't throw it in your face that you're offline. All right. So next up, very short slide, websites. Um, we all know them, so let's move on. <laughs> well, basically, I used the Drupal icon because I want to make the comparison with, if you have a Drupal website, normally the average web page at the moment, I think it's two megabytes, which is quite a lot. Uh, especially for Drupal sites, most of them are content heavy, images heavy, and the whole um, fastness of a website, the whole optimization of a website is usually the last thing the client thinks about not with big clients, but with small clients, I always need a very good Wi-Fi connection to even go on your Drupal website. Now, to fix this, Google came up with its own HTML. <laughs> uh, they, they basically said like, oh, let's invent our own HTML spec that is faster. So they used the normal HTML spec and they created their own custom package of it. Basically, they created their own custom package that don't allow JavaScript uh, that only allows certain tags. Of course, um, Google Tag Manager is in there, so all the ads are still in there. Basically, it stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages. So they say it's super fast, and it basically also is, because you don't have any tracking, except for Google's tracking. You don't have any, <laughs> obviously. Uh, you don't have any like huge stuff that's blocking the page. You don't, they all. They have very um, strict rule set. Like, if you go to Google PageSpeed and you go like, "Oh, I want to make my um, website faster," they kind of enforce all their um, good knowledge into forcing it. You can't build a bad AMP, for example. Now, um, how do they do it? They basically strip down what we now all know as HTML, and they start limiting stuff. Um, Basically, it's not even valid HTML. So, in my eyes, it's kind of crap, but people can use it, of course. Now, why did they do it? Because Adblocker is coming up, and they kind of feel trapped because of the fact that they won't have ads on every page anymore, because people are using ad blockers. JavaScript is no longer allowed, They're not even extensions, so Adblocker won't work on AMPs. So, basically, on every, I was looking up GIFs. I don't know if I actually implemented one. No, I was looking up GIFs of AMP, but I couldn't find any GIF where that showed that they always will have a advertisement on top of it. 
<laughs> they always show it without ads. But basically, it's for ads. That's why they do it. Now, <coughs> they also focus on news agencies because the whole hassle was about the fact that news agencies, the news agencies, um, weren't able to block ad block users, so they kind of build up a wall for ad block users, and then other ad block extensions came to light, and it's just a big mess. So basically, it's for news agencies who want to deliver their content very fast to the end user and a nice experience through Google. And that's the only case, really. You can have blog articles on there. You can have other stuff on there. Basically, it's for edge cases. Um, so how about in Drupal world? Now, there is a project called AMP. It's developed by Lullaba, and it's developed for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. It's been tested quite a lot. Uh, I think it works pretty fine. Um, I think there has a, around 300 websites using it. So basically, there is a very good use case to use this. If you have a client that has a lot of ads that they want to put in the world or throw around, it's a very good use case for it. Now, if Google did it, Facebook did it. So Facebook did exactly the same thing, but instead of keeping it in Google HTML, they developed their own custom stack of HTML, and they called it Facebook HTML. <laughs> no, that's my name for it. It just they made Facebook HTML. Basically, what it is, it's basically all the same stuff. It's stripping down. They limit stuff. It's not valid HTML, and it only works inside the Facebook app. So again, if you have a Facebook, if you have a client that uh, does its marketing or distri distributing through Facebook. It's, again, a good use case. So it's super fast because they load in the entire article, and they will implement art, um, advertisements again in all those pages because they can, and then they can force it again. And then they're sure that it's going to stay there. Again, it's for news agencies and edge cases. Um, now, in Drupal world, that means also a module. Um, it hasn't been used that much because I think it's more edge case for most of our clients or Drupal clients. Um, but it's also compatible with D7 and D8, or built for D7 and D8. Now, if you have to name it, basically it's RSS. Um, it's just badass. It's just RSS on steroids. So don't think about it as making a website all out of these technologies. You can implement it on top of it to enhance the content and to enhance its spreading, but basically that's it. And also you're stuck to Google or Facebook, which every developer kind of is negligent to do. Um, <coughs> now, next one is Android Instant Apps. So basically, apps are still pretty huge. Uh, do not say immense. Uh, why? Because they're really cool to use. They're, they're working offline. They always work. So it's really awesome that um, Everyone has apps. Now, Google figured that the strength of the web is that you can link through websites. So that's basically the strength of the web. You can click any link, and you arrive at a page that you don't know existed before, for example. So basically, you link to anywhere on the web, and it will always work. Now, with apps, it's something different. You can't say, uh, oh, this is direction for Google Maps from there to there. Well, you can, but then you kind of need the app. So they figured. If we make the app, only Android did it for now because they just announced it on the last Google I.O. Um, they make the apps modular. So basically, you get a message from anyone saying, oh, this is a recipe, for example. You click on it, and what it does, it downloads the application, but it doesn't download the entire application. It downloads the application without you knowing it, so it downloads a modular part of the application. And when it does, um, you only have the app. And when you close down the app, the app gets removed again. So you don't have the whole hassle of uh, downloading the app, accepting everything, accepting all the user agreements, blah, 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 going through splash screens. No, you just get the app instant, instantly. You still have to download the modular part of it. But you get the app instantly. And you can start using it. But it's limited. You can't have a menu that goes to every other capability. You just have the app. For itself. Now, they made the use case of if you're walking around and you want to have a, um, and you go to a parking meter somewhere in America or something, I don't know, and you, you park your car, you get out, and then you think about, okay, I want to pay, but don't have any cash, I don't have any Wi Fi, then they can basically just put up a pole there with Bluetooth 
where you can scan your phone against, and then the Bluetooth sends the part of the app that you need to pay. It sends it to your phone, you pay, you close down the app, and the app is gone. So you don't have all the rubbish from everyone tracking you always. So that's kind of nice. Um, so I said this, Android only, and it's deep linking, because you have the link there. So you can kind of link two parts of the app. Um, you don't have to install it, it's faster, and you don't have any hassle. I said this already. Um, now, for who? For what clients can you use it? It's for clients that already have an Android app. It's basically an enhancement of apps itself, or enhancements of Android apps itself. Um, Google mentioned that they need um, about, I think, two days, or developers need about two days to have their app and then just make it modular, so they kind of work all by themselves. If it's true, I really don't know. I'm not an Android developer. So, how about Drupal? Nope. Yeah, it has nothing to do with Drupal, but it is part of the offline instant world. So that's why it's here. Now, I have to give the word to Swentel. I have to give this along. Okay, so I'm going to talk about application cache. Now we're getting really, really nicely. Um, so application cache is old. Um, it's actually very, very old if you look at the history of the web, like the web exists for 26 years. Application cache exists already six years. Um, why I'm saying old? Because the reactions that we got from doing Frontend United and making Frontend United website offline when we were walking around during uh, the conference, a lot of people didn't seem to know about the technology, about application cache. Who actually knows about application cache in this room? So that's four people. Have you used it? A little bit? Yeah, okay. So, but that's... That's interesting because there is actually a really powerful technology available that can make uh, your web so website actually uh, work offline. Now, even though it's old, it's already deprecated, <coughs> uh, which is kind of ironic, uh, but that's, that's the web. The web goes fast. It's deprecated, um, so Firefox and Chrome are actually discussing um, when they're going to remove it. Uh, not everyone is really happy about it because the alternative at this point um, there is an alternative, but it's not supported yet by all major browsers. So, application cache, um, like I said, it's supported in all major browsers. Um, and it gives you a true offline experience. So, when you go to a website which is application cache enabled and your Wi-Fi is down, you can actually have content, um, which is nice. And it's just in your browser. It works uh, really out of the box. Uh, and what's really important to know is that uh, application cache is not equal to browser cache. It's kind of like one of the big critiques about application cache, because it's, it's kind of annoying. There is a browser cache. Um, the browser can store images and whatever, but application cache does not talk to the browser cache, for instance, to get off images um, if, they, if you want to show them. So how does it work? It's, it's ridiculously easy. It's, it's fantastically easy. You just need a manifest file. Uh, it's a really simple text file um, with the app cache extension. Uh, and then you add an, a manifest attribute in the HTML tag, just like in the example. So the extension is app cache. Uh, now it's called manifest. You can call it whatever you want. Um, if at, at, at the moment that you have that attribute in your page, your page becomes instantly available offline. So, um, but what's important, um, and one of the cautious what we get to at some point, um, is that not everything on your page will be in the application cache. So the HTML, HTML will be in the cache, but assets like images or CSS or JavaScript or uh, fonts, things like that, they are not immediately in your application cache. So you have to define all the resources that you want to uh, have to serve an offline experience, you have to define them explicitly in the manifest. That's kind of annoying, so you have to figure out what do you want to serve, how do you want to serve it offline, um, do you want to have the same version of the website um, when you're online or offline and things like that. You have to think about it because it's kind of tricky and there's a lot of pitfalls uh, right there. So how does it look like? So the manifest anatomy, it's really simple. So the first line is cache manifest, it's mandatory. Um, I actually don't know why it's mandatory, but yeah, 
Just put it there, and then it will work. Um, yeah, I haven't looked, looked up the spec, but yeah, whatever. Um, so the second section um, is a cache uh, line. Um, that's actually optional. Um, what this does is actually listing all the resources that you want to have offline. So in this example, this is just a page, but it can also be an image, it can be a JavaScript file, a CSS file, uh, whatever. So when your browser reads the manifest file, it will look at all the pages and then automatically start downloading all the pages that you want to have offline. Um, so this, this is in the manifest. Um, second section is fallback, uh, which is actually really nice. So if you are um, offline and you would go to a URL that is not in the manifest, the browser will look at the fallback uh, section and serve you a page which is actually the fallback. So the fallback page, you can put some nice things on, on there like saying, hey, you're offline, blah, 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 but you can still um, uh, look around and, and look at the content that we will s we'll be serving you. Um, this works for um, uh, just pages, it also works for uh, images, so you can have a default fallback image so that you don't force your user to download any image in the application cache. Because there is a limit in application cache, um, I don't know it by heart at this moment, but it's not that you can say, hey, let's start downloading 200 megabytes of, of data, that's kind of pointless. Um, so it, it's good to have fallbacks um, for images or pages uh, in any way. Then there's a, f a last section which is called network. Usually, just put an asterisk there. What it means, it's, uh, it tells um, the browser when um, you are online. Uh, just try to, to fetch everything uh, possible. So in, in that case, like images, um, you don't really want to have them all offline. Um, so in that case, just put an asterisk there. Uh, it will work uh, out nicely. So how do you update a cache? It's kind of like uh, one of the pitfalls. Um, the only way to update the content in your application cache is by changing the manifest file. So if you would change a page, it will not be automatically updated in your application cache. The browser will look up uh, at every request whether there's something has changed in the manifest file. If it, the manifest file has changed, then it will look at the resources in the file and start updating all the stuff in your cache. Um, so that's really important. Um, one of the um, strategies to do that is just to put a comment in the manifest file. Uh, what we have done from Frontend to United, for instance, and what the module does, is just it just puts the request time there. Um, so every time we are updating something um, in the Drupal uh, backend, we flush uh, the manifest file and then we also uh, change the timestamp so that when the browser does a new request, it sees, hey, this manifest file has changed, although nothing has really changed into um, the resource list, for instance, but there was some kind of page or an image that was changed, so we need to update our stuff. Um, that's really important, um, and uh, also one of the gotchas. Uh, there is a simple API. Um, you can do stuff with that. So there's a window application cache object, um, which you can use. Um, it has a couple of statuses that uh, tells you whether the manifest has been downloaded, whether everything is updated, and things like that. Um, and your browser also sends out events. So you can listen to a couple of event, events. Um, and in this example, we are listening whether the manifest has been updated or not. In that case, we're uh, throwing an alert. Um, an alert is not that user-friendly, so you should do something different. Um, and what we actually have done in, in Frontend United is just showing a nice little message like, hey, your content has been updated and things like that. Um, so the gotchas, I told you a couple of gotchas. Uh, check your cache headers. Um, if, if you would serve the manifest file and you would tell uh, in the headers that, hey, cache this thing for 14 days, then you're in real trouble. Uh, because if you need to update something in your application cache, well, the browser will respect the cache headers and say, hey, this manifest file is valid for 14 days. So you're basically stuck. There is no other way to tell the client to update the application cache. Um, <coughs> and, and, unless you have a Twitter account and say, hey, uh, please clear your browser cache, uh, your browser application cache or whatever. No, it's, it's the only uh, uh, thing that you can do. So watch out for that. Um, another gotcha, which, is, which was kind of annoying when we were trying to develop this for Frontend United, pages which are in the application cache are served um, from that cache even when you're online. So, 
sometimes it's cool because it's ridiculously fast. There's no round trip to the server or whatever, but depending on what is on your page, maybe there's something dynamic or whatever, you really might want to go online and fetch something on that page or whatever. So be aware when you uh, are thinking about what do you want to have offline, that there's nothing really dynamic on it or whatever. Um, um, because, yeah, it, it won't uh, do a round trip to the server. Um, what's also kind of annoying sometimes is that, um, uh, like for the first time, if, if you would visit a website and the man there is an error in, the, in a resource, like a 404 or a 500, the manifest uh, will fail, there will be no application cache, you will be not be um, uh, offline. In case that you would update the application cache and there is an error, um, it will still use the old version of the application cache until you have solved the problem. Um, so that's kind of annoying. Um, we hit that a couple of times, sometimes with images, because of the dynamic nature of image cache and, and things like that. Um, there is a really good uh, article um, with not not so nice title, but um, it's it's actually the article that I read a couple of times just to figure out what or how we're going to implement this for Frontend United, what I have to look out for when I was creating the module for it. Um, really good article, just read it if you want to play around with it um, and not get frustrated. Um, so for who is this? What can you do with it? Um, you can do simple sites. So we've done it for Frontend United. <coughs> um, at some point when Mathieu asked me to uh, write uh, a real native app, I was like, no, I mean, this is a Frontend United. Uh, conference, let's do something with the browser. Um, and I mean, the only thing that we wanted to like have offline is like the schedule. It's like the most important thing. Or a page which tells you where all the nice bars are or the museum or whatever, things like that. Uh, what did we have uh, offline as well? Speakers? Yeah, speaker schedule and yeah, a nice like welcome page, whatever, <laughs> with the logo of the main sponsor and things like that. So. That's basically just, it's just HTML. It's, it was like five pages, <coughs> and it felt like kind of stupid for me to like start writing a native app, or maybe in a hybrid app. Um, it would cost me, yeah, maybe a lot of time, although we spent a lot of time of figuring out how actually application cache worked, so maybe I would have been faster creating the native app, but it was a nice experiment. Um, so you, I've, I've put up like a, a bullet, say, it's for developers. Not really, because in the end, it's kind of easy. I mean, just like the simple manifest file, it's so easy. Um, but you have to watch out for the issues. Read, read the uh, a list of part article, and then you know everything about the gotchas and whatever. Um, there's kind of a security thing. It runs on HTTP, uh, like the alternative that exists only runs on HTTPS. The alternative is something that much you will explain later. Um, Security is in that sense, you can do nice stuff, like if you are online, you are logged in as a, as a real user, you can also store the session and you can do stuff with that. So you have to watch out if you're communicating back and you have a session cookie and things like that, do, in a, do it on HTTPS. Um, it's a common thing to do, right? Um, so there's a Drupal uh, module for that, I wrote it, uh, especially for Frontend United. Um, it's currently only Drupal 8 uh, only. I'm not really planning to do it for, or, or to port it back to Drupal 7. Um, if anyone wants it, um, I'm happy to accept patches or maybe even add you maintainership if you really want to use it. Um, it has a lot of features. Um, the most important one is actually, yeah, you can configure the resources that are going to be in a manifest file. I mean, that's the important part that you need. Um, and much of the other features are, are used on the Frontend United website. So we have a dedicated offline slash path route. Um, what that does is it renders existing nodes in a different context, like the offline context. You can have different formatters. It's all optional, you don't have to do it, but it, was, it, it seemed like a good idea for us uh, because it also has a feature to have dedicated block regions and a dedicated page and HTML um, template. Why? I mean, if you look at a really dynamic website, you have a lot of blocks on various pages and whatever, and if you have to figure out how to get that in your application cache, it's kind of hard. And in the end, what you want to serve, depending on your use case, of course, is might be a, a diminished version of the content. So you don't care about like all the left blocks with weather or whatever. I don't, I don't know. Um, 
So you have a dedicated page in HTML template just to basically have a, a, a nice header with the logo, then the actual content, uh, and then a footer. There's also a menu option. Uh, might sound weird because uh, might sound weird because there's a menu module in, in Drupal. The, magi the menu uh, feature in, in the module, um, what it does, it actually knows about the offline path route. Um, it knows about aliases that you can define and, and things like that. Um, so you can use it. Um, it can scan for images in, in nodes. It's kind of in, in a handy feature in that sense if you have a content type with an image field. Um, like I said, if you just go to a page which has the manifest attribute, it's only the HTML that's in there. You also might want to have the image as well, but if you need to f need the full resource, yeah, you have to look at the, yeah, the actual source and then copy paste and things like that. The module has a, has an option just to scan and it renders internally all the nodes. It figures out whether it is an image or not, and then it creates the. Um, full URL and puts it in the manifest. So uh, it was really handy because we had a lot of speakers and images and it was kind of boring. And it's error prone as well, uh, copy pasting things. And when you have an error, then your application cache doesn't work. So we try to um, make sure that everything will work. Uh, and there's also a manifest validator. Um, it calls out to a service that will check your manifest and report back if something is wrong. Usually, it's, it's hard to get something wrong. Um, so, uh, if you just use the backend, uh, you will be okay. Um, it has more features that are not necessarily related to application cache, um, but more related to something that Mathieu will talk about. Uh, you can add a home screen manifest and a launcher icon. Um, and we also have two strategies. Uh, strategies. So the strategy, strategy. Jesus, that's a stupid word. Strategy, strategy, strategy. Plan of approach. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So the plan of is that a good word? Plan of approach. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Oh yeah, plan of attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other options? Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, we add. Um, so what we've done for Frontend United, we use the offline route, and we add a manifest to all those offline pages. Um, and there's also another option which we do not use. We have a block uh, which just renders an iframe, which calls a URL which has the HTML, um, so the manifest attribute. Um, why is that interesting? You can, um, for instance, put that block on your home page. And without the client even knowing, um, the application cache will start downloading uh, the manifest and make your website um, available offline. Uh, we didn't do that because we have a dedicated menu item on the front end United website, which just tells you go offline. I mean, that's, that's good enough, right? Um, so let's do a demo. Um, we don't need Wi-Fi, although initially you need Wi-Fi. Um, if, if, you, if you have a mobile phone and you're um, uh, and, and if the internet works, <laughs> um, you can go to frontendunited.org slash offline slash homepage or just go to frontendunited.org and there's a menu item um, called offline. And I will do that here as well. Uh, that is searching. How do you go back? Come on. Ah. Okay. Uh, oh, switch your funding. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if you click on offline, so we have actually that's my first thing. He's he's a front end uh, person and he wanted to have a different like CSS styling uh, as well. Um, so the actual offline version is really different than uh, the desktop version or the online version. Sorry. Um, and so we have. A couple of pages here, um, which are the most important ones that we want to have offline. So we have the schedule, um, speakers, where where is the venue, and we also had a page where you could uh, figure out where you had to uh, go and eat or <laughs> go to a museum or whatever. Um, so now for the moment supreme, um, where do I turn on Wi-Fi? I don't use Macs, so I don't know how that works. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the Wi-Fi icon is gone here. <laughs> oh, that. 
turn Wi-Fi off. Woohoo! Okay, just to prove that I'm really offline. Uh, <laughs> it's his laptop. <laughs> so I'm actually offline now. I can start playing the game if I want to, but let's not do that. Um, let's go back to uh, frontendunited.org, and we're still browsing around. It, it just works, and it, it's really nicely. Um, I don't re need Wi-Fi. I still have all the information that I need. Um, if you're on your mobile phone, you can add, add a bookmark, and then uh, it just works. You don't need a native app. You have... I think around um, six pages of HTML, really, really small data, and then some images, and it's all in your application cache, which is really nice. Um, the other feature that I talked about, like the um, fallback, if I would just type any URL here, like say, um, hello, dev days, um, it will automatically go back to the fallback page, um, just telling you, uh, you can put anything you want there. Um, and so you're actually offline. Um, I have another tab open. Uh, where is it? Magazine London. Yeah? <laughs> uh, OK. So. What I wanted to quickly show you as well is um, the actual backend. Uh, where is it again? I think web service. Okay. Yeah, I'm offline. <laughs> so the Wi-Fi doesn't work and, and then now it goes back to the fallback, which is nice. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not broken. Well, actually, I am broken because I wanted to show you the backend. So uh, you can download the module if you want. Um, the backend is not that hard. It, it has some sections to, to uh, manually configure the resources. Um, it has a section to manually configure the menu and things like that. So, but it's a nice example how it actually serves your, your content if you want to. So um, I think that's about it, what I wanted to talk about. Let me see if I have some more slides or not. Um, yeah, we have a little video, but we're offline, so that, that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. So that's application cache. Application cache is really nice, um, and it's really easy. And um, I mean, like it's it's very interesting for like very small things like website uh, conference conference websites and things like that. Um, you avoid the cost of having to create a native application and things like that. Um, and it's just plain HTML. It's the technology is there. It works. It's powerful. It has gotchas, but. Yeah, it's it's easy to overcome them. So that was application cache. And let me give you back too much. Does it work? I think so. Okay, so yeah, that's a green shot from Matthew's iPhone. Um, basically what we're showing you here is um, how you can also add <laughs> but that's basically it. All right. So, le moment suprême. <laughs> so basically, what we covered is something that's deprecated, badass RSS, and some crappy Android new technology that they modularize their own applications. Now. The really cool part is that the whole, um, in my eyes, future of the web lies right there. Uh, Google calls it progressive web applications. Everything is progressive. So, uh, so let's talk about service workers, what they were actually talking about too. So 
Service workers is this magical thing on the web now that gives you control over the network layer. Um, to put it in front-end terms, because I'm a front-ender and I really don't get that. Uh, to put it in front-end terms, the service worker is a JavaScript file that you add. And you can install the JavaScript file. And as soon as you install the JavaScript file, that's basically the service worker. Now, the service worker gives you control over all the files that you want the browser to cache. Basically the same as app cache, but app cache, um, it was possible in app cache, so the thing Swentel talked about, it was possible in app cache to actually cache the file that defines the caching. So you're kind of in an infinite loop of, you never get out of the cache anymore, <laughs> which is kind of a bad approach. Now, service workers is kind of the, nuclear bomb to fix everything that AppCache kind of tried in the beginning. Uh, it's very new, um, but it gives you control over all the files, basically. It sits in between the browser and the, um, and the internet itself and says like, okay, these CSS files you don't no longer need to fetch, you can just cache them locally and every time the browser loads, just take those cache files. That's insane, like we're talking about all the assets we don't know legal, we no longer need to fetch over the internet, we can just serve them. It also means that we can have fallbacks for everything. So that's where the offline uh, capability comes in. You can just say, okay, let's open up everything. Like if you have a messaging app, you can just open up the messaging app. You will still have everything. You don't need to fetch all the messages. It's already stored in cache. But the fact is that we don't cache the CSS and the JavaScript file, so uh, we kind of can't show anything which is kind of a bad user experience, and that's why apps are currently winning. Now, this is, the service worker is the magical part of the web that's gonna give us the advantage over applications, because we can basically have everything. It opens up bigger capabilities to push notifications, background sync, uh, it's all included in there, offline capabilities, and you can cache everything you want, and you have full control over it, and you can invalidate it if you need to. So, it works insanely fast, too. Now, uh, I kind of jumped all over the place, but how is it done? Um, basically, they learned from AppCache and they defined, okay, we kind of need HTTPS to say the least because uh, we don't want any um, people going on public Wi-Fi's and random stuff going on top of your web page, being ads and telling the user that, oh, this is part of the website. So you very need HTTPS. It's a it's the very first thing um, you need to even consider um, service workers. Now, this is a chart that shows um, all the major browsers, but it shows the enthusiasm for service workers. Now, Chrome already implemented, Firefox is on its way just as Opera. Um, Edge basically notified the, the world that they're working on it, so that's a very good thing. And Safari is closed as always, but they mentioned somewhere that they kind of are enthusiastic about it, but nobody's really sure. Um, now the thing about Progressive is you can use it, and you can use it, and all the browsers that use it, and all the all your end users of your client that use it will have a huge benefit. So Safari will just hop a bit behind, but. It's progressively, so if you are on a browser that doesn't use a service worker, it will just fetch everything from the network. So basically, you will have the same crappy, slow experience we already have now. So, not that bad. Um, now, the app manifest, no sorry, the web app manifest, it's um, the same concept as uh, Christoph explained, or as Svendel explained. It's basically just, basically, it's just an XML file that you can define, okay, I have a website, I want to make it into a web app. <laughs> and, uh, oh, not XML, I no clue what it is. <laughs> it's a file. <laughs> uh, what is it, is it dot, dot app cache? No. JSON? Okay, JSON. I know CSS and JavaScript. <laughs> is that, no. Oh, Jason, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> uh, so basically, it says all the, all the things, like uh, you, you can have an icon for, if you click on the, um, if you click on the home screen button, and your 
web app opens up full screen, you can define the background, you can define what color the address bar is on top, you can define almost everything that a normal application has uh, access to. You have an icon, you have, you have background, you have orientation, uh, you can define the, the display full screen or not, and so on. So, um, the normal behavior is basically the browser wants a website, it asks uh, the internet, and I gave it the Drupal icon because it looks better, uh, and you send everything back. So that's the slow experience, that's the normal behavior. Um, where the service broker comes in is basically the thing in between. Um, it doesn't have a logo yet, so this is my, uh, <laughs> my idea of it. Um, it's just in between and it just, okay, I'm a service worker, the browser just asks for 100 assets. Um, I'm gonna check what assets I already have on my local disk, so on the browser itself. And then it just goes like, oh, I already have 70 assets out of 100, I'm only gonna fetch 30. So it doesn't get any faster than that. You can just fully control it. Um, now, service worker, how it works is, <laughs> Just some examples on, on how it works internally. So you you just have to write your own JavaScript file. It starts with you name your cache cache name, and then you say, okay, I need these files. Um, now, on a Drupal world, we all know we're never going to do this manually. So um, not already made a module for this. Then you can define which assets you want to cache. But if you would do it manually, it's easier to explain like this. So you would define the assets you need, index.js, app.js, some uh, PNGs, and so on. So as soon as you define them, and the browser loads your website for the first time, it's gonna call the install. So you're gonna install the JavaScript file. So basically, because you're, it's an installable JavaScript file, they call it a service worker, because it's uh, for web applications. So when you install it, uh, it goes, um, okay, let's wait until we got everything um, cached or when we fetched everything. So it says, um, open up the cache name. So it's gonna fetch all the files. And then it's gonna say, um, so it's gonna add everything on the first time. So as soon as you install the service worker, it's gonna, inst it's gonna cache all the assets it loads the first time. You can't fix the first load that you're gonna have cached everything. It's just kind of impossible. Um, and after that, you're just gonna return all the cache, uh, all, the, all the assets. So basically it's gonna not um, put any extra loading on the first time it loads, but it's gonna um, store everything that you need storing for. Now, that's only on the install um, listener. Then, every time now um, the service worker needs to fetch assets, it's every time gonna uh, check if it has a response in the local um, storage. And if it does, it's gonna return the local storage, so it's gonna be super fast because it's just reading from disk. And if it doesn't, it's just gonna fetch it normally. This is a very basic example of what it does internally. That's why I, I really like this snippet a lot. Because just, if I have it cached, I'm gonna get it from cache. If not, that's the only delay you're gonna have, checking if it's in cache or not. Now, you also have an activate. Um, uh, you kind of need this. <laughs> Maybe it's not that um, easy to explain, but basically if you install it first, you kind of need it to be activated on the first load too. That's what this little snippet does. Um, now, why would you need a service worker? Because it's immense speed enhancement. So, um, not on the first load, but you get an enor enormously uh, big push towards assets you can serve to your end users. So let's say you have a basic page, of, uh, you have a page that loads um, two megabytes, which is the average size at the moment, then you're gonna see it drop over time every time you do a new release because people already have stuff cached. You, hold, you have the caching control under, under full control, like you can then say if you want a new service worker that defines new 
um, assets, you just change uh, the name of the cache. It's going to remove the old cache. It's going to implement the new cache, which is basically if it has loads of the same assets, it's not going to fetch the new assets. But if it has new assets, then it's going to fetch or delete and renew them. So you have full control. Um, there are loads of snippets. I'm going to show some links afterwards. Uh, there are loads of snippets that basically will always be the same on every uh, manual you're going to read because it's kind of this snippet you need for this, this snippet you need for that. So you don't have to try to hack your way around an application cache, for example. Um, now, you also have um, the road is now open to background sync. So there's this horribly um, architected uh, thing called IndexedDB. And index is like a database. It's called index, I believe. I'm not really sure. It's called it's a certain database inside the browser where you can store caches locally. Like let's say you have um, the website of Drupal Dev Days, and you're scrolling around, and let's say you can favorite certain things, but you're fully offline. So service worker enhanced, and you click on this session. I want to favorite this session. I want to favorite, and you're still offline. You still need some kind of a layer that you can store data in, where then afterwards you can fetch it from, to like, OK, the user did something. The same thing like uh, in the very beginning when I showed um, WhatsApp. And then you send a message, but you kind of close the application. But it will get sent. People don't doubt the fact that it will get sent as soon as you get online. The same thing happens here. You can store stuff inside IndexedDB. There are loads of snippets online, but way too long to, to actually explain them all. Um, but you can store stuff inside a local database, um, and then you can fetch it from, and then you can store it back online, because that's where we want all our stuff still. We don't want everything decentralized on some phone. Um, how, how on Google I.O. they explained it was, you have to see internet as an enhancement almost if you start working with progressive web apps. Because you have to work offline first. And as soon as you have internet, let's save their data. Let's sync their data. Let's give them push notifications. Let's, that's a very nice idea to think about it. But, but offline first would mean that every browser should support offline first. So it's kind of dodgy there. It's more of a sales pitch from Google, I think. Now, it also opens up the road to push notifications, which is kind of awesome. Like, you have, a, uh, you have a website, and you're walking around, and you favorited one session of Drupal Dev Days. All of a sudden, you're walking around. You're having a hangover because Belgium won again in football. And then you kind of have, oh, I need to go to the session in half an hour. And you're offline because you ended up in some, <laughs> some streets and were drunk. <laughs> and you get a push notification offline. Oh, in half an hour, I have a session. Which is kind of awesome. They, they, it kind of also opens up. Um, Screwing with our users by pu sending push notifications about everything. Hey, we have a new article about this, about that. So we have now control over push notifications, which is kind of awesome too. Um, this is going to be the road to replace apps, in my perspective, also in Google's perspective. But apps no longer have any advantage uh, over us. Um, well, they kind of do uh, some advantages, but we're getting super close with this. If, if you really enhance it in a way that for your client you can really use it, it's going to be extremely useful. Um, so you have to think about it offline first, and also you have flaky internet connections. So let's say you have, they call it Li-Fi. So you have Wi-Fi, you're super connected, but nothing kind of gets through. So it's, it's lying to you, it's Li-Fi. So you, you're looking at it, and you, you're waiting for like a screen to load, and you're waiting for 10 seconds, and shit just doesn't happen. And you're just waiting there, and the user goes away. Now, because it's offline first, you kind of can't show the website, just like WhatsApp won't wait until, oh, I think I have internet, I think I have internet, and just wait until, ah, oh, yes, it works, I have some internet. They just show everything they have. And if you have internet, it's kind of an optimization above it, or, a, or enhancement, I should say. So for flaky internet connections, it's the same. Um, we shouldn't throw it in the face of our users if they're not online. We shouldn't throw it in the face of our users if some, um, some guy somewhere in a data center is screwed up 
something or plugged in a cable in the wrong way. Like, it's kind of a very nice enhancement if you think about it, because it no longer will show the dinosaur jumping around and people waiting and, and trying to refresh. Um, okay. For who is it? Basically every website, uh, basically every project or every client you have, because there will always be stuff you can just cache. And if you think, oh, but they will change eventually, well, then you just update your service worker and you have new cached files. Um, it works super fast. You don't have to implement push notifications. You don't have to implement background sync because it's quite complex and not a lot of use cases where, use cases where you can copy from. But everyone who starts using this whole progressive service workers approach notices it immense um, speed performance enhancement or speed enhancement. Um, so in Drupal, uh, for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, there is a module developed by Nod, and you can find it under slash PWA. Um, you have some extra links. I'm going to put up the slides afterwards. The photo is taken. <laughs> Uh, some nice extras, you have a splash screen, like on an app, when you click on something, oh, you're going, oh, this is an app, you have a whole, like, the whole color, right? Like, I like color, I'm a front-end guy, I like color, this is nice, you can define your own logo. Uh, what we didn't do, but what I read up afterwards, was that you can kind of make the black bar on top, you can make it orange, because the same orange you have, because only on Android, but you really have the whole app experience. Um, yeah, all these things basically are defined in the web app manifest, the JSON thing. <laughs> um, you also have, don't have an address bar, so this thingy, which always is in the face, and it kind of all goes a bit more up. So Andreas is a bit more up now, which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you also, like, when you're playing around, and browsers are going to implement this all in their own ways, um, when you're playing around with service worker and your user gets on your website and they're kind of scrolling through it, and some, let's say Chrome, will say, oh, if the user is three minutes on your website in a whole day, I'm going to, and you're working with service workers, I'm going to give them a notification like, hey, you want to add this website to your home screen, so you want to install the website, which is kind of awesome. You just you're gonna have an app. You don't have need to run through the app store or, or stuff like that. I don't. I don't need to worry about iOS developers or, or Android developers. Just you have a website. It, it kind of works, which is awesome. Uh, and now I have to thank our sponsors of Drupal Dev Days. There we go. And I think we have questions for one minute. <laughs> yeah. As far as I know, it, I think AppCache has a limit of three megabytes, which is basically nothing. You can store some CSS, some uh, small, three or five. Yeah, it's five to ten. Oh, okay. Well, you can't store a Drupal website in there, right? But with service workers, you don't really have a limit. You can basically store everything, which I find really weird if you come to think of it. Because if everyone's gonna do this, then as soon as you open up the browser, you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna stuff your browser with, with service worker things. So. I'm not really sure how they're going to manage that in the long run. Um, yeah. So the question is if, if uh, service workers have any access to the website, if I can... No, it's just to know if they are there, because of the name, it's not the... Uh, no, they're they, they separate. Yeah, they are yeah. separate. Yeah. Okay. Mm. One, in, one interesting thing about service workers is that service workers actually uses the browser cache as well. But it's a bit smarter than an application cache. Um, so all the, all the assets that are stored are, are actually stored in your browser cache.
Okay, that's it. I think, no. <laughs> Well, you have uh, Chrome now developed their whole uh, DevTools thing, and you now have a tab um, that you can inspect your own service worker, and you can inspect what the service worker cached, what version of the service worker it's using, because if you're going to throw a new service worker at a user, chances are it's going to use three versions ago service worker. So they're all going to use different versions, but they're going to keep using the different versions as long as they're offline until they sync back to your online website, and then you're going to get the new fetched version. But it's very complicated to kind of debug if you have any weird thing. Um, but now they develop the whole dev tools that you can actually expect, uh, inspect service workers and see what's cached where, how big it is, uh, how old it is, uh, stuff like that. App cache? <laughs> uh, I'm curious uh, about the um, uh, storing of data that uh, later can be sent to a server somewhere mm. and uh, the push notification. Uh, do the uh, uh, mobile phone um, manage uh, the uh, progressive web app as a, a standard app? So, um, for, for instance, You can you can basically decide. You can you can you can. Yeah, but you can decide like, in the normal use case, you would say okay, if they really want to have a form, you kind of want the data immediately. Let's say if it's a contact form or if it's a subscribe form. If it's a subscribe form, I wouldn't say try the offline background syncing because you're kind of giving access without really knowing if they already filled in. Yeah, but you can fully choose that. You can fully choose what you're going to make offline, background sync, or what not. So you can just um, say, OK, these pages are accessible offline. But it's not the, the ideal way to say, OK, everything is now accessible offline. Because you don't want the contact form to be accessible offline. Uh, yeah. You hmm. Yeah. You are offline now. Uh, this interaction uh, is, uh, uh, happens when I, as soon as I get, uh, I get the network online, or I have to do something to. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, nor normally, the how service workers works, how I understood it is that as soon as you connect to the internet, the background sync will work. Okay. There were some. Uh, Yeah, we chose application cache for Chrome UI because it works on an iPhone. Otherwise, we would like to have all the iPhone users on the UI. That's why we chose application cache and not services. I think we have to get to lunch. Yes. But you can shout. But people can leave if they really want. So. <laughs> 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 <laughs>